So welcome to today's edition of The World Today on the war in Ukraine's seven months and counting. Today's discussion examines, feature, examines um, po uh, features policy, media, academic, and country experts who will update us on the state of Ukraine seven months after the Russian invasion and at a time when despite continued Russian aggression, Ukraine appears to be taking some territory back. I'm very, very delighted to welcome to Perry Waldhouse, Irina Mazur to my left, uh, an honorary counsel of Ukraine to Philadelphia. Before this appointment, she practiced law in Ukraine where she held various positions, including working in the anti-monopoly committee of, Lviv, of the Lviv region. She has been very active in the Ukrainian community in the United States and serves on the board um, of two nonprofit organizations, Razum for Ukraine and Ukrainian Federation of America. To her left, uh, I'm sorry, to my far right, Judy Rubin is the Worldview columnist for the Philadelphia Inquirer, a member of the Inquirer's editorial board, and a beloved visiting fellow at Perry World House. Her column runs in many other US newspapers, and she recently spent three weeks uh, on the ground in Ukraine this past July. To my far left, Rudra Sill is a professor of political science and director of graduate studies at the University of Pennsylvania. He's taught at Penn since 1996, and his scholarly interests encompass Russia, Eurasia, uh, studies, comparative politics, international development, labor politics, and qualitative methodology. To my immediate right, we have Sandy Vershbo, who's a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council in Washington, DC, and a distinguished and beloved visiting fellow at Perry World House. He was Deputy Secretary General of NATO from 2012 to 2016, U.S. Ambassador to Russia from 2001 to 2005, and U.S. Ambassador to NATO from 1998 to 2001. May we have an early round of applause for our distinguished guests. So you're all here to um, gain expert insights into what's happening in Ukraine. And in the lead up to this conversation um, on stage, we were obviously having a discussion in my office about what was happening, why what was happening still really matters and how we could use what is now 56 minutes left to the program to ensure that you all left here knowing far more uh, than when you came in. And so we wanted to start with a kind of very general question um, given three developments at least that have happened over the past couple of weeks. One being there's been discussion about mobilization in Russia. There have been, there's been talk about this for months and now it seems like it might be coming um, to fruition. There's a referendum that Russia will in fact hold uh, in four areas of Eastern Ukraine whereby um, people will vote about being essentially a part of Russia. And obviously Ukraine has been engaged in a very significant and very impressive counteroffensive where they've been reclaiming territory. So I wanted to start by asking our guests, given these developments, where are we now and what does this audience need to know about how these three elements intersect with one another? And I'll start with Trudy on my far right. And Trudy, you're gonna definitely need your microphone and there you go. Uh, thank you, Ashan, very much. Uh, I think that where things are now, um, uh, they're at a very critical turning point. And the key question is whether the United States and uh, its European allies are going to help Ukraine take advantage of this key turning point. Uh, what do I mean? When I was in Ukraine in July, in the three weeks between when I arrived on July 9th or 10th, and I left on the 31st, uh, the key thing that you should know is that morale boomed because the United States finally supplied Ukraine with HIMARS, uh, long range precision, multiple rocket launchers and ammunition for the HIMARS. And this changed the whole situation on the battlefield. And it's why we have seen this advance that just happened. So why do I say critical turning point? The HIMARS allowed Ukraine to hit behind enemy lines and uh, destroy logistics and command posts for the Russians. This has made a tremendous difference. It's why they were able to take the territory. Time is of the essence here. Ukraine has to move much further before winter. 
There is no prospect of negotiations now, not even on the horizon. In order for Ukraine to move further, they may need more sophisticated precision, long range weapons and air defenses. So far, the West has not provided them, nor has it provided the tanks they will need to move forward in the South. So the critical question is, will the United States, and it is in the forefront, what the US does, then Europeans follow with some pressure. Uh, will the US do it soon uh, while the uh, allies are feeling it's worthwhile because Ukraine is moving before winter, which affects gas supplies, of course, in Europe. It's already cold weather in Ukraine. Uh, there are those who say, fear, fear, fear. Uh, Putin will be cornered. He will use nukes. He will mobilize. This talk of mobilization isn't happening yet. I do not believe at all, and I, we can talk about this later, that he used tactical nuclear weapons. So this is the moment, and the US has to decide whether to help Ukraine move forward, which is the only way uh, that may finally bring um, Putin to the bargaining table seriously. And I don't think he ever will be serious at the bargaining table, but it's impossible to stop now. Uh, and this referendum uh, annexing territory is part of the expression BS, uh, because nobody will recognize it and that can't be allowed to affect the momentum. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Trudy. And there was a lot in that and we'll be able to return to it. And I wanted to move to Rudy to ask again, given these, these three developments, where does this leave us now? Yeah, um, before I say anything else, I, I wanna be clear about my general position, which is that I think on a normative level and a strategic level, the invasion was a blunder. Uh, it did not have the requisite uh, rationale behind it. And I recognize that and regret that everything that's going on and condemn the invasion. But uh, I'm a political science professor for 25 years and my job is to mess things up. And so I, I want that statement to be on record. Now, uh, it's, a lot of things have happened that brought us to this point, um, including uh, the very idea that Georgia and Ukraine could join NATO in 2008. Things started to kind of get more tense uh, in Moscow. What do we do with this? What are we gonna do when parts of the former Soviet Union join NATO uh, besides the Baltics? So there's been a lot of stuff that happened that I'm not gonna go over in great detail, though in my classes I do, uh, and a lot of it is subject to debate. What we have come to now is a key moment because mobilization is something Putin had sought to avoid. This very phrase you've been hearing, special military operation. It's not war. That's why Putin wants to say, there's a special military operation. War implies mobilization. War implies throwing everything at the enemy. And he has been avoiding doing that to try to create the semblance of normalcy in Russian cities to keep the citizens kind of like calm and mellow while you know throwing all kinds of uh, conscripts at the war, trying to get by on the cheap. That didn't work, obviously. And so now we're at a really, really critical moment because if we do go into mobilization, wartime hysteria will actually escalate. There will be more opposition to the war, but I think it'll be swamped by an even greater and more intense wartime hysteria and support. That's what happens around you know any country, right? Rally around the flag. So I fear that this mobilization is setting us up for a very long, drawn out war that will not only go into the winter, but well beyond uh, maybe one, two years, who knows? Um, I uh, am with Trudy in the sense that I think the Kremlin is clever enough to realize that once you cross that threshold of using tactical nuclear weapons, you're opening a Pandora's box and you have to be careful with what, what comes back at you. And I think this is something that I agree is probably not gonna happen. It's always probabilistic. Uh, but I do think this issue of mobilization is something that is going to create a new challenge for Russian society, uh, along with the referendum, which is then creating this sense that if in Russia it is believed that Donbass is now Russian territory, then defending that Russian territory does open the door to all kinds of means, as uh, Dmitry Medvedev has been saying. Medvedev is really the most hawkish sounding person, even though in 20, 2008 20 to 2012, when he was president, we thought he was the mellower guy. Uh, but no, so these two things have really uh, changed things. The counteroffensive significance in my view is that it has actually created more momentum for mobilization, more calls for mobilization. Uh, it has been successful, but we have to remember that 
Kharkiv region is probably number three in terms of the list of priorities after Donbass and the Southern Front. And that's where the entrenched Russian forces are. Uh, so, you know, while there's reason to be upbeat for Ukraine, uh, while there's reason to think ab about the possibility of pushing back, uh, we have to recognize that these were areas where the Russians basically flee. Even the Ukrainians are saying they're fleeing faster than we can keep up with them. What does that imply? It means there's a fast, prepared retreat. Uh, so I would not read too much into uh, in inferring something from the counteroffensive for what kind of battle we would see in the Donbass and uh, uh, and the Southern Front. So let me stop there. That's a great reminder. Thank you. And Irina, from your position? Um, actually, before I would answer a general question, I would like to make some uh, point that the Russia, if they will call for mobilization and for the referendum specifically- just a, We understand that term to mean a draft. Yes, it's a military draft. And also it's a specific set of law that officially gives the Russian president more power, power into his sole hands. but. Coming back to the issue of referendum, interesting point is that the information that I read, the only region when they do not intend to call for the referendum, it's a Kharkiv region. Why? Because Ukrainians liberated Kharkiv region almost to its borders. So it means it will be extremely hard for Russia to hold the referendum there and to have successful almost 98% results with the referendum at the area fully liberated by Ukrainians and at the area that does not have pro-Russian support. So coming back to the general team, you all have to know, I'm a volunteer diplomat. In a normal life, I am just an immigration attorney. I'm a US citizen. I look at the situation as a US citizen and as somebody who is born, who was born in Ukraine and who represents Ukrainians in this commonwealth. So for me, I always have a dual point of view. First, I do objectively believe that the current success that the Ukrainian army has, it actually, because Ukraine, uh, Ukraine was provided by significant military supplies, weapons, ammunition, mostly from the United States, because it's United States who were actually working with our European partners, um, and that's why Ukrainian army was able to advance. It is, I do believe that it is in the national and strategic interest of the United States to help Ukraine because as a country, we truly, I don't believe, I'm not a diplomat. Uh, I don't have a career as uh, ambassador of Russia, but I do believe that we don't need Russia as a strong country right now because they are not capable, they're not willing to be strong and reliable partner. They break every possible agreement. They're always acting aggressive and they undermine principles of the American democracy. As somebody who was born in Ukraine, what I really care for that American nation will keep its sense of what is going on in Ukraine because Ukrainians, they truly depend on you. They depend on your assistance and humanitarian assistance in your advocacy with your state and federal representatives. And basically they depend on American support. And for me, when I speak with everybody like around with people like you, I truly feel the support, but it's a human nature that we all get accustomed to live in problems and we all get accustomed to live in stress. So for me, it's important that all of us first will be fully informed what is going on in Ukraine, why we help Ukraine and why Ukrainian nation depends on us. So for me personally, that's what I'm slightly probably diverting from answering the main question. But what I wanted to tell you, please keep your eye on what is going on in Ukraine and please help uh, continue helping Ukraine. Thank you. And Sandy, then from your perspective. Uh, thanks very much. Is your mic on? Thank you. Uh, I would say, first of all, in response to what Rudy said, uh, this was not only a Russian blunder, mm -hmm. but it was a crime. Uh, and it's created one of the worst crises in uh, European security, transatlantic security since uh, World War II. It's a crime because Putin basically violated every rule in the rule book, ch changing borders by force. Uh, committing all the sorts of violations of the laws of war 
by targeting civilians and, and committing war crimes. And in the process, he's potentially overturning the European security system that we've depended on since uh, the end of World War II and since the end of the Cold War. So the stakes are very high. Not only, it's not only about Ukraine's survival and its freedom as, as an independent state, but it's about the survival of, of the world order based on the rule of law rather than the law of the jungle. Now, when this war started in February, uh, no one thought Ukraine had a chance of uh, withstanding the, the Russian military. Uh, but we've been surprised at every, every turn. But even this summer, uh, the conventional wisdom was beginning to say that uh, this is turning into a stalemate, a war of attrition, uh, and that uh, the Russians ultimately, with, with superior firepower, uh, would eventually grind down the Ukrainians and force them to accept an unfair political settlement. But lo and behold, in, in a matter of just weeks, as, as Trudy said, everything changed. The Ukrainian counteroffensive has uh, not only put the Russians on the back foot as the Ukrainians have recaptured lots of territory, but it has shown that a Ukrainian victory in this conflict is, is possible. So it makes it all the more urgent that the United States, its allies, uh, around the world, but particularly our NATO allies, do everything possible while there's an opportunity to help the Ukrainians prevail. Uh, now, the Russians clearly are, are disoriented uh, and embarrassed. And we are seeing now just in the, in the news of this morning and this afternoon that Putin isn't going to kind of throw in the towel. Uh, on the contrary, his war aims have not changed. He still wants to basically erase Ukraine as a sovereign state from the map. He's trying to erase Ukraine's national identity and carry out a policy of forced Russification. Uh, and uh, he doesn't have the means to do that. I think we've seen that in Ukraine's uh, ability to defend itself and now go on the offensive. But, uh, but he still is seeking that kind of radical outcome. So uh, the news today is that he is at least moving toward a general mobilization, a draft that would move, trying to fight this war with a peacetime army to a much larger force to make up for the clear manpower shortages that have led to these significant reverses. And uh, he's announced uh, that he's gonna respond favorably to the appeals from this, these puppets in the occupied Donbass to hold a referendum on their independence, excuse me, a referendum on their, on their annexation uh, to the Russian Federation. Uh, this may be seen as a gambit uh, while he still doesn't have the, the military power to push the Ukrainians back, to raise the stakes by saying, basically, you, know, you fought in Ukraine this, thus far. Are you ready to continue to fight on, on sacred Russian land? Uh, I hope the answer to that question is yes. We shouldn't in any way uh, pay any heed to this illegal effort to carve off parts of Ukraine's sovereign territory and annex them to the Russian Federation. Uh, we need to continue to, to provide the military materiel and equipment, especially these longer range uh, strike systems like the HIMARS, which have made such a critical difference on the battlefield. Uh, I agree with Trudy's point that you know time is of the essence. Uh, the winter is already beginning to uh, set in in Ukraine. We need to accelerate the provision of these weapons. Think about what additional categories should be made available to the Ukrainians, such as F-16 fighters, Patriot air defense systems, so that they can achieve uh, even more decisive uh, victory uh, before the winter sets in. Only then might there be a more favorable environment for negotiations. Right now, the Russians aren't prepared to accept anything other than Ukraine's capitulation. Uh, but uh, you know, wars usually end with, with some kind of negotiated outcome. Uh, maybe this one will be the same. Maybe the Ukrainians simply have to take back all their territory and defend it from that point forward without a peace agreement. But, but that's a subject we can talk about in the discussion. Thank you. Uh, so thanks to all of you. And you've raised a lot of very interesting questions. And I want to let uh, or points. And I want to let you all know that in um, nine to 10 minutes, uh, we'll move to audience questions. And so you should be prepared to line up uh, on my right hand side where there's a standing mic. So in some ways, we can look at the conflict, uh, the invasion as uh, failed diplomacy, really. And um, Rudy, you pointed out that you thought that this was obviously a blunder. Um, everyone has pointed out that time is not on our side and that winter is already um, happening in Ukraine and issues of oil shortages and people being displaced are in fact quite acute. Um, 
And Sandy, you made a point of saying that it was a crime, but it was also a crime in 2014. And so part of my question to this panel is, and there's been a lot of armchair analysis of Putin and his, 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 his motivations, his goal, whether he's self-destructive, if this was such a, an obvious blunder, why did he make it? But my question is like, is there a diplomatic path forward? And in particular, what, whether what happened in 2014 informed and strengthened him for 2022 and therefore how that should shape our response now. And anyone is free to go first with that question, Trudy. Yep. On and, and right in front of you, yes. Um, uh, I think uh, you just have to look at history to understand why the likelihood of a diplomatic point, uh, path forward, especially now, is just not in the cards. In 1994, uh, Russia, along with Ukraine, uh, the U.S., and Britain, uh, signed an agreement under which Ukraine gave up the nuclear weapons it had inherited from the Soviet Union, uh, and um, uh, in return for which Russia committed uh, to respecting the sovereignty of Ukraine. You can see how well that was honored. In 2014, under pressure, from the Europeans, Ukraine signed a, a, a protocol for negotiations called Minsk. Uh, there was Minsk I, there was Minsk II, but the bottom line was, and I won't go into the details of Minsk, the talks were um, conducted with U uh, European uh, overseeing and Putin unilaterally changed all the provisions of Minsk and turned it into something which if Ukraine had gone along with the rewritten rules that he imposed, changing the goalposts, um, Donbass, uh, which Russia took one third of after 2014 invasion, uh, Donbass would have been virtually independent and would have had the ability to control the politics in Kiev. It would have had a veto over anything to do with Russia and Ukraine. It, and the border of Ukraine, uh, which the negotiations were supposed to give back control of to Kiev, because the Donbass is on the border of Russia, and under these talks, Ukraine was supposed to get control of that border back. Uh, the piece of Donbass that Russia had would only have had autonomy, but it wouldn't have been independent. Uh, Putin changed the rules while the talks were going on in such a way that Russia would have had access to that border and would have been able to continue to impose uh, with its troops, with its intelligence, people control of the Donbass. And I have interviewed people who have escaped from the Donbass. In 2014, I was in the Donbass after the Russian proxies took it over with the help of Russian troops. There is no question that Russia did that. It was not a spontaneous uprising in, in, in the East. And moreover, during those years of Russian control, uh, when I interviewed escapees from the Donbass in February of this year, when I was in Ukraine, the stories they told, Russia has treated the Donbass like occupied territory. It has closed the coal mines. It has taken apart the factories. Um, and it has basically left no employment for young men except to join uh, the fake military units there that now fight for Russia. And that's why young men are fleeing because they're being forced into that military and forced to fight their brethren in the rest of Ukraine. So when I say there's no possibility for negotiations now, Putin is not looking for real talks where there might be some quid pro quo where Ukraine would agree not to join NATO, into which it's never going to be invited anyway. Putin is looking, as he has said over and over again, to rebuild the Russian empire. And to do that, he wants to control Ukraine and destroy it as an independent country. 
And until he changes his perspective, which can only be changed by further Ukrainian victories on the battlefield, taking back the territory which Russian troops have illegally seized, until that happens, there is no point in talking to Russia, which has said publicly that it will never give up the land it has taken. Thank and you. it has taken much more than the Donbass. Thank you, Trude. I want to give Sandy a, a moment to respond as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, I agree, Trudy has recounted the, uh, the, hi the history of uh, the Minsk agreements and why Russia was never serious. Uh, I would just point out a more fundamental mistake by the West, by, by the United States and its allies in particular, was we didn't uh, respond harshly enough to when the Russians started down this road, which was with the annexation of, uh, of parts of Georgia uh, in 2008. In fact, within months of that uh, crisis, we had the reset in relations with Russia. And it was back to business as usual. And again, in 2014, when Russia uh, reacted to the uh, Maidan revolution, the, the uh, revolution of dignity in Ukraine, by annexing Crimea and uh, stoking the so-called separatist movements in the Donbas, uh, we imposed very weak sanctions and basically uh, you know, continued with dialogue with the Russians. So I think Putin had the, the feeling that he could get away with this more, more fundamental second invasion of Ukraine. Uh, fortunately, NATO's response has been much stronger. And I, uh, I'm fairly optimistic about NATO unity holding even through the winter time when the gas supplies may, may, may be, be running out and the European homes are, are cold. Uh, I think they had, have woken up to the fundamental challenge that Russia poses to the to the international order, and uh, it's like the scales have fallen from their eyes in some countries, uh, and I think that they will continue to back, doing everything we can to to support Ukraine until uh, it can uh, re re recover its lost territories. So, in some ways, Trudy, you are not optimistic, unless I, I'm mishearing you about Russia ever coming to um, the negotiation table. On the other hand, I think, Sandy, as a former diplomat, you have to retain some optimism about a path forward that you've described as a negotiated peace. I'm interested in hearing from Rudy and Irina about what you think brings Russia to the negotiation table. Well, I think, do you want to go first? <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, first of all, I think um, there are a lot of different perspectives on everything you heard, on the significance of Minsk, on the reasons it wasn't implemented. And I'm not talking about Kremlin disinformation, I'm talking about you know, Western scholars, Western journalists who have different sources and uh, interpret what's been going on over the last 10, 15 years in, in a very different uh, light. That is not a, meant as an excuse for anything, but it is meant to raise the issue of how messy things are. One of the things to remember is this notion, this rebuilding the Russian empire idea. And the guy came to power, Putin came to power in the end of 1999. This is 2022. This has got to be the slowest rebuilding of an empire. What, what was he planning to do? I mean, this is like a very, very late <laughs> attempt to start this process. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind that for 22 years, we didn't have this problem or we saw flickers of it here and there, but nothing major. Uh, the other thing to remember is that whatever its imperfections, one of the reasons Zelensky won 70% of the vote when he was elected was that he was talking about uh, diplomatic solutions. He was talking about improving relations with neighbors, by which he meant Russia. Uh, he was able to get turnout to go up in the eastern part of uh, Ukraine. And I think there was a hope that this would happen. Uh, but very quickly, I think it became clear that this was not going to go forward. So I think from Russia's point of view, I think there will be enough people there who will say that there was something around Minsk that could have been negotiated. And certainly, this idea of not joining NATO was a critical issue. Uh, at a minimum, I think people should be aware that very legitimate scholars with lots of experience have argued both sides of this. Former U.S. Ambassador Michael McFaul says, forget NATO, Russia was just want, not wanting to allow a real, true liberal democratic state on its, on its borders. Okay. Uh, very well-known scholars, Fiona Hill and Angela Stent, have made it very, very clear very recently in, in uh, work that they've published that there was, in fact, a long-standing frustration over NATO expansion. It goes back to interpretations of what was promised to uh, in the 1990s to Gorbachev and Yeltsin. Uh, and this is, you know, I'm not saying one side is right or wrong, but at a minimum, we should recognize that 
there are contending viewpoints on this. And it's important because it speaks to the issue of whether a diplomatic solution is in fact possible. If you believe this is a repeat of World War II, that this is Sudetenland and Anschluss, then you know, the answer is no. The only, only answer one can have is hard strength, total defeat. And I, I'm hearing that from my colleagues who might respect tremendously. And there is a logic behind that. I'm not saying they're wrong. But there's also, we should explore the possibility that did we miss a chance here? Did we, is there a counterfactual here? When Russia sent the United States uh, in late 2021, uh, it's sort of quote unquote red lines and the US said we will respond in writing. And a few weeks later, we give them that response in writing. What was going on? I mean, if the Russians really wanted to take over the, the slowest way to attack is to sit there for three, four months and then attack after showing off all your weaponry, all your positions, uh, this is not exactly the way you run a blitzkrieg attack of a country. So they were expecting something back that was a little bit more constructive than they got. And it's only after that that I think things really you know, escalated. That said, it's still a blunder. It's still a you know, violation of international rules and norms. Uh, and it's still you know, creating huge costs for not just Ukrainians, but for Russians themselves. Uh, so I think you know, it, it's still an error, but it was an error that came at a moment, I think, that could have been potentially avoided. Uh, you know, it's it's a not a belief. It's not a normative position. It's a possibility, and I, I cling to that possibility because I think the alternative to some sort of diplomatic solution happening soon is whatever is going to happen is going to cost even more lives. We haven't even seen the potential loss of life, and for me, that's the important thing. I'm actually a pacifist. I'm opposed to all wars, and uh, so in that context, I think the faster we can get off this, you know, destructive path. Uh, the, the, the better it'll be for everyone in the longer term, uh, prevent loss of life. That's sort of my starting point for this. And I think we have to allow for the possibility that a diplomatic opening could emerge. It might require more strength. You know, it might require the West to step up, but we have to keep it, do that with an eye, eye to the possibility of bringing Putin to the table, which I think can be done. Irina, your sense of what brings him to the table? Well, I actually happy that um, you went first because it would allow me to respond to very specific points. Well, first, you all should know that Russia created, organized, funded separatist movement in eastern Ukraine in Crimea in 1990s. Ukraine regained its independence in 1991. So since that time, Russia was planning this entire invasion. So that's why I respectfully disagree that they were, they, they were sitting around for like almost 30 years, didn't do anything. No, there is actually evidence provided on official level by the Ukrainian side that whatever was organized and happening in this area, it wasn't a matter of one day, one month, but actually had root in the 1990s. Second, well, if you conduct a regular negotiations, like face-to-face -face on a human level, you expect that your opponent is dealing with you with the straight face, and you expect some kind of productive result. Well, it was Russia, negotiations with Russia, although I would be more than happy if we would engage in negotiations and they will be productive, I do not believe they would be practical, reasonable, and actually realistic. Why? Because it's a different negotiations. You have different sets of cards. It's a political cards, it's a military cards, it's economical cards, um, it's geopolitical cards. What Russia was doing, if you actually noticed, when they announced, again, military actions at the beginning in February, they were not moving very fast. But what they were doing, they were moving their troops through the southern part, through Crimea, through the bridge that they actually built, and they accumulated a lot of military presence while having different kind of um, areas of fight in eastern Ukraine. Why? Because what they, they effectively they want to do, they want to connect eastern Ukraine with southern U Ukraine effectively to control the entire Black Sea. What does it tell me personally? I'm not a great politician. I do, didn't really study uh, diplomacy or economics or, I don't know, history to such level like my esteemed colleagues. But on a very simple level, it tells me this is the direct intent, what they want to do, what they want to achieve. So sometimes when they're sluggish about things, well, there are also a number of reasons why they do it. They were accumulating their forces in the different regions in order later to unite them and take the control over the Black Sea. That would be their black, uh, the, the, that would be their big card later to play 
in negotiations, not only with the United States, but also with Turkey. There is a, if you actually notice the relationship between Russia and Turkey during the six months, it's very interesting point of view. Also, totally separately, we will not, I will not talk about it in details, but think and analyze what's going on in China. You all must know the Chinese government officially has a vast territory of Siberia in a long-term leasing. So it means that they control efficiently large economic and transportation hubs in Siberia. So while Russia is doing its own actions in Eastern Ukraine, I actually always very curious what Siberia, what, what China will do, how they will respond. And I, and I actually assure you that China is sitting and watching. Thanks. Coming. Thanks, Irina. I, I, yeah. we're, I'm, I do want to, I do want at 23 minutes left in the program and we need some time at the very end to make sure that we are including audience questions. I have two lines, two questions online at least, but I wanted to give people in the room an opportunity and I see someone moving away from the mic. So is it, if there's no one at the mic and as you make your way to the mic, then um, are, are, are you prepared to ask a question? Yes. Okay, and so I would ask that you move toward the mic and speak very loudly. All right. Um, so thank you for an amazing talk. I have a question on the uh, economic future of Russia and how do you assess it? So looking at, at the data, at all the business withdrawals from Russia, at the whole exodus of the Russian talent, high tech, literally everything, and also looking at Europe potentially weaning off from, from Russian energy resources. Is there an economic future for Russia? And looking at that future, is there a future in which Russian economics actually allow for continued warfare in Ukraine? Okay, and I would ask that in your responses that you, we keep them brief so that we get to as many in-person and online questions as possible. And not everyone has to answer every question, but who would like to take that? Sandy, it looks like you're being nominated. I'm being nominated. Apparently. Is your mic on? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I'm, I'm not an economist, but it looks like Russia has a pretty bleak economic future. Uh, it's one of the many uh, aspects of this crisis in which it's shot itself in the foot. But uh, it has finally woken up the Europeans to becoming more in, independent uh, from their dependence on Russian oil and gas. And of course, the sanctions, while they haven't bitten as hard and fast as we would have hoped, in part because of the high price of oil and gas that is sort of like a loophole in the regime. But, but I think their G GDP is likely to contract as much as 15% this year, which would be the highest, even higher than during the 90s, which was supposedly the, the low point for Russia. Uh, and uh, I think it, it, with this exodus of the high tech uh, specialists, uh, Russia will be even less and less of an innovative economy able to kind of lift itself up. So, uh, you know, there's a way out of this dead end that they're driving themselves into, which is to end the war and get out of Ukraine. Uh, but that doesn't seem like a, a likely proposition. So unsustainable, Trudy. I would just add here, sorry. Yeah. I would add, um, Erin uh, uh, mentioned China. Um, I think what you also see from this um, misbegotten war on Putin's side is that it is weakening Russia vis-a-vis -vis the only allies that it has left. Uh, for example, now that uh, Europe is weaning itself from Russian gas, uh, you see that it has to sell oil and gas to China and India at a steep discount. So while it is still selling and because world prices are so high, um, uh, it can still uh, bring in income. Although this year's surplus has shrunk to almost nothing. Usually Russia has a big surplus, but Russia as a colleague of mine once wrote is basically a gas station with nukes. And so it, re it depends on that, but Putin has driven the productive economy into the ground. And I would predict that just as China already has probably millions of people working in the Far East, 
Um, you know, I would not be optimistic in predicting who will control the far east of Russia a decade from now. Um, but we are still dealing with the present where Putin has enough cash to continue this war, but he is consigning the future economy into uh, much deeper economic uh, difficulties than it already was. Um, both from Irina and Rudy, very briefly, a response about Russia's economy and its future in light of the war. Last time I went first and you jumped on me, so this time you go okay. first. <laughs> Very quickly, I truly believe that the economic sanctions imposed by European nation and United States truly working. Uh, the Russian economy is collapsing. It's true that we have players like India and China who are paying for Russian gas. But it is my sincere hope that after tomorrow's Putin speech and general mobilization, Russian society will finally wake up. And actually, the process of separation of Russia into different regions will start, st finally will take, take a start. Why? Because Russia has its own resources, oil and gas, not in Russia. They have it in Bashkirtostan, in Tatarstan. It's two independent republics that were also captured in the past and completely occupied by Russia. So if this entire process that Putin is imposing right now into like general mobilization, to imposing more um, limits into the Russian society, my last hope, it will wake up, Russia will be divided because the process of division in Kaliningrad is already brewing for years. So, and if Russian economy will collapse and the country will be divided, it will be much easier for us as Americans to deal with new Russia, to deal with new countries, to deal with countries that would be more inclined to respect international law and order. And also do not forget, like in Germany after the war II, Germany went into a specific period of time when they paid retributions and when they had to understand and accept responsibility for their actions. It will be very hard to deal with that in Russia, but until Russia as a country and this Russian society will go through this process of deputinizing, of basically cleaning their brain and their souls, we will not be able to have them as a country that could be an equal partner to the European allies and to the United States. Thank you, Irina. Rudy. I'm gonna to try to just go back to your main question, which was about the economy. And I think any answer to that needs to think about time frames. I think in the short term, they survived largely due to oil and gas. Uh, but also, you know, they had built up a big, gigantic you know, foreign reserve, half of which is no longer accessible to them, but half is. So in the short term, I think they've weathered the sanctions better than many people thought. Uh, the Economist has a very interesting article from a few weeks ago where they're sort of laying out some of the de details on that. But that's short term. I think in the medium term, there will be costs to pay. Uh, the GDP will shrink. They've been keeping a lid on unemployment, but that's going to get progressively harder. Um, there will be opportunities for you know, some people with capital in Russia to buy up some of the space that is being left as Western businesses retreat. Uh, but overall, I think the medium term, which I'm imagining to be sort of one, two, three years, maybe up to five years, will be rough and it will affect the next generation, which didn't live through the horrible 1990s that, that the Russians keep talking about. Uh, so they are, you know, they're used to a more comfortable uh, standard of living and expect more. Uh, so I think we will see some of that. But in the longer term, beyond that, I think we have to keep in mind that issues like brain drain have been going on since the 1990s. It's not a new phenomenon. Uh, and so I think that has been also balanced by some people returning. It's been, there'll be other things. Energy will continue to be important to the developing world, even if Europe uh, you know, shifts away from fossil fuels. And that dynamic too pre pre predates the war, right? It predates even 2014. It was evident that Europe's demand was flattening and the new demand for global energy is coming from the developing world, from China, from India. And these are not just tactical short-term moves, right? China and Russia have been collaborating. This energy deal that they signed was 2014. India and Russia, including India and the Soviet Union, have a long history of cooperation. Modi, in fact, just yesterday said, you know, the friendship between India and Russia is unbreakable, even as he was pushing for a quicker end to the war. Uh, so I think the global economy has shifted. The West used to be a much bigger chunk of it. 
It's still a very important chunk of it as a per, on a per capita basis, but the rising emerging economies, the developing world will provide an interesting uh, outlet, I think, that in the longer term, very long term, post Putin, I'm talking about, you know, a couple a generation down, uh, the economy will eventually stabilize. So short term, okay, long term, okay, medium term is the problem. And that's where I think Putin, we have to decide how long Putin will live, but will he see the medium term? Will he you know, make it past the medium term? I don't know. So in the interest of getting to more questions, um, we'll, we'll not have everyone answer every questions and I may just kind of direct questions to each panelist. And I'm gonna to move to a question we have online that's really about the end. And so it's about the end, not in terms of necessarily negotiated peace, but it's about the end in terms of whether or not there will be an international criminal court investigation and prosecution and whether Putin will ever be put on trial. In some ways, I think that's it's 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 a bit premature, although the investigations and accumulation of evidence obviously are happening now. But I'm interested, uh, let's say Sandy, kind of very briefly, your reaction to the possibilities of an ICC prosecution. Yeah. Well, how this is going to end is hard, very hard to say at this point. But I think that uh, it's more likely to end just with a ceasefire than with a comprehensive political settlement. And uh, that'll make it harder to get the Russians to address international concerns about war crimes. Uh, they, of course, don't accept the jurisdiction of the ICC, nor does Ukraine for that matter, although they're ready to allow ICC personnel to investigate war crimes on their territory. Uh, so justice uh, in that regard may be hard to achieve. We may have to maintain sanctions uh, and keep up the pressure until perhaps when there's eventually a, a more Western-oriented regime in Russia may belatedly address war crimes that have been committed. Uh, but I think, it, as I said, it's more likely to be a ceasefire. I don't see the Russians abandoning their ambitions to annex Ukrainian territory, and I don't think the Ukrainians are ready to, to give the Russians any of their territory, even one inch. So uh, uh, once there's more of an equilibrium on the ground, uh, you may get a ceasefire, but, uh, but not a comprehensive peace. Great. From the audience. Ambassador, just in terms of a member of the panel, thanks for your time. Uh, arguably, NATO stronger than it's been in the past 30 years, with the extension of Finland, Sweden, and the military commitments to GDP. What further opportunities are available for NATO? And then, uh, what strategic missteps should NATO uh, seek to avoid as the conflict progresses? Thank you. I think that's for you, Sandy. Well, first of all, NATO is in good health and uh, allies are finally getting serious about uh, spending more on defense and bolstering NATO's defense and deterrence posture. And they took some important decisions this summer to beef up uh, the full-time presence of NATO forces along the Eastern flank, both in the North and the Baltic region, but in the Black Sea region as well. So, uh, and Finland and Sweden are gonna bring, you know, real additional strength to the alliance, countries with strong militaries who've engaged with NATO for years as partners participated in NATO military operations and exercises. Uh, at the same time, NATO's direct border with Russia grows with the Finnish-Russian border. But I think that uh, uh, if NATO continues to maintain this credible deterrence, showing our ability to react to any, any threat, uh, the Russians are not going to uh, pick a fight uh, up, up there. May I have 30 seconds to come may, to, to, to the students who have taken IR 101 international relations and security studies. I just want to point out that as you strengthen an alliance, even if it's a defensive alliance, the other side tends to see this as aggressive. This is known as a security dilemma for those of you who have read your textbooks in, in time. But a security dilemma is a longstanding concept that international relations scholars have been dealing with. And if we see the NATO expansion through that light, it doesn't surprise, it shouldn't surprise anyone that the reaction to that might be to see it as more aggressive, even if that's not the intention. Uh, that, may, that may not alter our decision-making given who we think is in the Kremlin and how to deal with them, but that's a separate issue. In general, defensive expansion uh, will still lead to a, a sort of a reaction. Um, so it's worth keeping that theory in mind, whether you buy it or not. Uh, not time to discuss this at length, but I just want to point out that you know when NATO started the policy of uh, enlargement, uh, first of all, it pursued this in tandem with a strategic partnership with Russia. Number two, NATO agreed to all kinds of uh, restraints on its own military deployments, which it even honors to this day. Uh, no nuclear weapons on the territory of new members, no significant combat forces on their territory. 
And you mentioned at the end of last year, there was the Russian effort to negotiate some new European security provisions. We were prepared to engage on some of those, things like no deployment of uh, offensive missiles on Ukrainian territory, uh, other kinds of confidence building measures. But the Russians wanted to basically roll back the clock by, by uh, 25 years, uh, reverse the membership of Bal the Baltic states and, and the Central European states. Uh, and it was kind of bizarre that the country that was occupying big chunks of Ukraine and Georgia and Moldova is the one that needs security guarantees, uh, whereas NATO is, is the menace. In fact, it's, uh, I think it was seen as the other way around. Um, and so um, this has been alluded to or spoken about actually quite directly, which is, you know, it's the theme that winter is coming. And uh, we've talked about this in relation to kind of how Russia will position itself, how hard Ukraine will fight back. Uh, what will be the reaction of everyday civilians to having to hunker down and live through continued conflict in the face of decreasing energy sources, de increased food prices, lack of scarcity of everything? So I'm wondering, I'd love to hear from both Trudy and Irina in particular, and, and briefly, what will should be the response to a continuing humanitarian crisis, and in particular, what an everyday person might do um, in the face of what will be a continued um, humanitarian crisis in Ukraine? And that is also one of the questions that we have online. Irina, why don't you go first? All right, I wanted to offer Trudy, but again, looking into, into the situation, through the eyes of American citizens, why do we actually have to pay for something that is so far away from overseas? While actually do not, I do not believe that um, it's only Ukraine, Ukrainian resistance who is causing this huge expense. It's a country, it's actually Russia's actions putting all of us in the position that we feel financial pressure. That's number one. Number two, again, from the American standpoint of view, there is a big interest that are at stake for the United States for the United States to provide assistance to Ukraine. Because as I said, this card with the Black Sea, it will not be a, if if Russia will take um, over this region, it will not be played nicely against um, any kind of country uh, in the NATO, including the United States. So it is in the interest of the United States not to actually have Russia as a strong country that will continue to possess a threat in that kind of front. From the point of view of human being, I do believe that we have moral obligations uh, to help Ukrainian nation. Why? Because as Trudy mentioned, because in 1994, it was American government who also became a guarantor of Ukrainian independence because America took an obligation, although as politicians and lawyers would say unenforceable obligation, to be a guarantor of Ukrainian independence. So Ukrainians moving with their politics and with their directions toward the West policies, they did rely on American promise. And I ask, is the American promise still hold some value today? And I truly believe it does because putting totally separately the great assistance provided by the American government, everyone that I meet, every human being in the United States supports Ukraine and actually uh, talking to people like you, it assures me that you are behind the regular Ukrainians who just want to live in peace, who want to have right to self-determination and who just want to have freedom, freedom to live like they want. It's exactly what the American nation wanted to have 250 years ago. Um, then coming back to Ukrainian point of view, as I said, they rely heavily on the assistance, formal and informal assistance of the American government and American nation. So for me, um, I truly believe in this victory because it will be a victory for all of us. Uh, we cannot actually rely on any negotiations or any kind of promise of talk because past performances, they actually show that Russia is not the country that you can negotiate with. But coming back again to this country, only in Philadelphia right now, we have about 10,000 Ukrainians who arrived from Ukraine, mostly women and children. People at this point, they came with nothing. They absolutely need our support. So 
to summarize what can we do, yes, we can continue to provide support as a country. Yes, we can continue to do advocacy for Ukraine. Yes, we can provide humanitarian assistance by donating to all kinds of nonprofit organizations of your choice. But also just be aware there are a lot of Ukrainians who arrive here to Philadelphia region because it's the fourth region that Ukrainians are arriving. Um, the first is New York, Chicago, uh, Florida and Miami, Philadelphia is number four. So if you will actually encounter somebody, just extend your help, extend your hand to them, try to help them as much as you can or connect them with me so we would be able to help as one united community. Thank you, Irina. Trudy, you were just in Ukraine. Your reaction or uh, answer to the question of how those um, humanitarian needs have changed and what we should be focusing on now. Sure. <laughs> uh, I think the question of whether Ukrainians uh, can face another harsh winter depends very heavily on whether Ukrainians see that the support from Europe and more importantly from the United States, although Europe is critical, does not diminish and that the support for their offensive continues and gives them the weapons that they need now, because that will keep the morale high, uh, it, because it holds open the possibility of regaining land that is existential to the future of the country, without which it cannot survive. Uh, when I was in Ukraine, over and over again, when I asked people why professionals that I knew were volunteering for the army when they'd never held a gun before, why civilians in Kiev, which is now peaceful, although it went through hell for two months uh, when the Russians were trying to take it before they were pushed back, why were they volunteering to go every weekend, sometimes during the week, to try to help villages and small towns that had been decimated by occupation, rebuild schools, put roofs back on, on homes of farmers. Why were they doing it? Because it's existential. When it comes to the question of Russia's aims, uh, Putin did not just start talking about rebuilding empire last month or in February. Putin has been giving speeches for years saying that Russia must rebuild its empire, that the dissolution of the Soviet Union was the greatest uh, um, geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century. His beliefs and aims are crystal clear. He has said in long speeches this year, which reflects things he's been saying for years, that Ukraine has no right to exist as a state. And in the occupied territories, the Russian rule goes back to Soviet days. It's, it's not even as uh, light-handed as Brezhnev. It's arrests, it's torture, it's deportations of civilians, including unaccompanied children, to Russia. So that I, I think Ukrainians are willing, have been willing, and will continue to be willing to suffer the tremendous deprivations uh, that Russia will try to impose if the war continues into winter. But the key is that they feel they have the world behind them, at least the democratic world, the US and Europe. And that is what I heard over and over again. We have no choice. But of course, Putin is expecting that Europe will cave because of gas prices and that the United States will cave because of domestic elections where uh, the GOP, larger and larger segments, are becoming pro-Putin and anti-Ukraine war. So I think the answer to the question is, depends on us, depends on Europe. Um, and on that note, and I have to say regrets to those who are still at the mic um, with questions and regrets to the many questions that we still have online and to an entire page of questions that I have, because we obviously have such a depth of expertise here that we could continue talking for a very long time. But we do wanna give uh, our, our visitors and our uh, panelists a round of applause and thank them for their time and their insights. Um, 
it's clear from our discussion today that the path forward based on history and what we all know about geopolitical affairs is extremely complicated. And you have people on the panel who everyone wants to kind of free whole restore Ukraine and yet it's unclear both how much Ukrainians are willing to endure, how much Russians are willing to endure, how much the international community is willing to uh, facilitate, intervene, whether or not there will in fact be still made a ceasefire a negotiated peace um but this is obviously a con conversation that we will uh, continue